Science, art, and industry are all essential to building any society, but mixed the wrong way, they can destroy one just as easily. Each bathysphere location in Bioshock acts as a chapter, and each chapter carries its own message. For that reason, we'll be looking at each chapter in sequential order, starting of course with the introduction. From here on out, I'm going to assume you know about Bioshock's big twist and the basic motivations behind Andrew Ryan's actions. Last chance to leave before spoilers. I chose Rapture. So, to cover the ending twist in case it's been a while, our protagonist is essentially a sleeper agent, given fake memories to mask his birth in Rapture. When he's activated, he uses the gun that's hidden in this package to kill the pilot, taking down the plane above Rapture. This is scrubbed from his, and therefore the player's mind, but back to what the player knows this early in the game. We've just been in a plane crash, and upon swimming to the lighthouse, we walk through its doors and we're officially inside of Rapture. The lights go dim and we're greeted with an impossible to ignore image of the hypocrisy that Rapture was founded on, and that would help in its downfall. No gods or kings, only man. Well, whoever this gigantic golden statue depicts, he clearly sees himself as being above man. Andrew Ryan. While he allowed himself to be outplayed economically by Frank Fontaine, he is, without a doubt, the king of Rapture, in spite of his clear statement against that sort of ruling body. Jumping ahead, we hear his propaganda against Frank Fontaine blasted over the Rapture intercom, and nobody else's. Back to where we were. Right off the bat, we know that this place is run by a hypocrite, one who perhaps has good intentions, but a hypocrite nonetheless. With this in mind, we advance down the stairs on either side of the room and see three emblems on the walls. Science, Industry, and Art the three cornerstones of Rapture's society. Ryan wanted these three concepts to be completely unlimited by laws. He sees them as free of any long-term evil, and essentially sees them as his gods. They may all lead to evil in the short term, but it's all part of an imperceivable master plan, a law of nature that will ultimately lead to the greatest good. So, as we think about the meaning behind these three emblems, we hop into the bathysphere and we hear Andrew Ryan's voice for the first time, as a pre-recorded message explains his motivations for leaving behind the surface world. America says the sweat of your brow belongs to the poor, Russia says it belongs to everybody, and the church says that it belongs to God. Andrew Ryan says he chose differently. He chose Rapture. This is our first time hearing the name Rapture, which of course has some religious meaning to it. That name, Rapture, it implies that there is indeed a god of this place. Either Andrew Ryan, as his giant statue implies, or the three cornerstones of society that he places his faith in, science, industry, and art. Well, as Ryan says Rapture, the projector backdrop pulls up and we get our first view of Rapture proper. And this place really does look like heaven in the sea. It's completely beautiful, save for all the advertisements we're bombarded with. Maybe Rapture is a fitting name. Then we get inside Rapture, and we realize that our optimism was misplaced. Immediately, we're thrown around like meat between wild dogs as a spider splicer murders a begging man right outside of our bathysphere before running off. As we leave the bathysphere, the spider splicer is chased off by Atlas's security drones. Clearly, whatever sort of vision Andrew Ryan had for Rapture, it's completely fallen apart. While the city may still look beautiful from the outside, it's hell in here. We keep going forward, finding ourselves a wrench to kill a couple of high lunatics with, and we're advised, or more like commanded, to use the needle that's laying in front of us. Probably the same stuff that turned all those people we've killed into lunatics. We pass out after our first dose of the stuff, and a big daddy and little sister pass us by, seeing as we aren't dead yet. We have no idea what's going on in this place, but it clearly isn't as good as it first seemed. By this point, we've also seen some imagery of another godly figure in Andrew Ryan's eye. The Great Chain of Industry, and by extension, Art and Science. The Great Chain binds us. Maybe you can infer what this means so early on, that if everybody pulls the Great Chain in their own direction, the chain is tight and strong. Altruism is the root of all wickedness. But even if you don't infer what it means this early, when you have your first splice, you realize that you have chains tattooed on your wrists. You might not know what the great chain is yet, but you're bound by it. The chains on your wrists, of course representing shackles, that link you to the great chain. And now the game's biggest question is asked, how is our character linked to Rapture? Based on what we've seen so far, we can infer approximately what happened to this once beautiful city. Some bigwig invented a way to give humans what is essentially magic powers, and the inhabitants of Rapture got addicted to the stuff and went crazy. Maybe 15 minutes into the game, its themes have already been hinted at incredibly well. Unrestricted industry mixed with unrestricted science, and it led to a whole lot of evil. Well, how does that third cornerstone fit in, unrestricted artistry? The next chapter happily fills that gap and shows us how that idea plays into the fall of Rapture, transhumanism. 
The medical pavilion, a place of science where artistry is surely not at home. Well, as I said in the introduction, artistry, science, and industry are all great, you just have to be careful how you mix them. And artistry should never be mixed with medical science. As we explore, we find two audio logs explaining that a woman named Diane McClintock was in love with Andrew Ryan, and after being rejected by him, she sought facial reconstructive surgery from Dr. Steinman. Until we enter his office, we don't know that Diane wanted reconstructive surgery, so let's step back to look at how we're introduced to Doc Steinman. Adam denies us any excuse, we see written on the walls as we venture closer to Steinman's office. Rapture clearly had a problem with transhumanism, and that they were advancing too quickly for their own good. Again, artistry has little place in this exact world of science. This man, Steinman, says in graffiti that with Adam, there is no reason we shouldn't all be beautiful and godlike. Well, there is a reason. We haven't yet evolved to be worthy of that power. We hadn't in the 60s, and we still haven't today. Thanks to the combined artistry of Dr. Suchong and Dr. Tenenbaum, the plasmid was invented, and their artistry drove them to push the human body to its limits, and sure enough, it cracked. That same scientific artistry runs through Dr. Steinman, a facial reconstructive surgeon. Science and art combining can be a great thing, just look at video games. However, medical science and art is a very dangerous combination, as we can see in Steinman's lab. The more literal meaning of Adam denies us an excuse is Steinman saying that we should all be totally beautiful. He sees his facial reconstruction as art, and he gets bored with his realism pieces, comparing his newer works to Picasso's abstract faces. Needless to say that his newer works are incredibly cruel mutilations of his subjects. Relative to the rest of the game, the Medical Pavilion is a simple chapter thematically, but we're just getting started. Neptune's Bounty as soon as we enter Neptune's bounty, we're greeted with another, more abstract example of Rapture's hypocrisy. The first thing we see is a man who's essentially been crucified, with the label Smuggler written above him. Upon further inspection, we see that he was smuggling Bibles and other religious paraphernalia. For a society that's willing to publicly execute a religious man, they sure are fine with performing a religiously visualized execution. This man was crucified by Rapture's god, the Great Chain. And as we explore further, a spider splicer sneaks out past our field of vision, asking who crawls in my garden. What crawls in my garden? With this, and upon remembering some of the things we've heard the generic splicers saying, it becomes clear that religion has been spread to the people of Rapture at one point. Jesus loves me, this I know. Which perhaps explains the incredibly harsh execution of the smuggler as a fear tactic to counteract this. So, who gave Rapture religion? Fontaine, and it was all part of his master plan to overthrow Andrew Ryan. The audio logs in this section explain a lot of the story of how Fontaine started his civil war with Ryan. Fontaine began hiring people to smuggle in Bibles and other religious paraphernalia because he knew that Andrew Ryan would crack down hard on the smugglers, making Ryan look more like the Thought Police, only out to help the rich. As Frank Fontaine puts it in one of his audio logs later in the game, Somebody has to clean the bathrooms, and he takes all of Rapture's downtrodden and gives them religion and a place to live. Fontaine's home for the poor, and getting them all riled up to overthrow Ryan before using the hallucinogenic properties of atom splicing to essentially turn them all into his own personal brainwashed army. A lot of this chapter is given further context by the later chapter, Apollo Square. Everything involving Fontaine's home for the poor and all of that is explored in that chapter, so by bringing it up now, that chapter will suffer as a result in this video. Moving on. The levels of Bioshock can essentially be divided into two categories, historical and parabolic. Levels like Neptune's Bounty fall into the historical side, as they mainly focus on the biggest political events that contributed to the fall of Rapture, while levels like the Medical Pavilion fall into the parabolic side, focusing instead on a microcosm of the sort of thing that happened in Rapture to contribute to its death. The parabolic levels generally focus on a combination of those three cornerstones of Rapture, science, art, and industry. In the case of the Medical Pavilion, it was a combination of science and artistry. So now let's move on to Rapture's personal greenhouse and oxygen tank, Arcadia. Arcadia, in keeping with the trend of the parabolic levels, is about the dangers of combining science with industry. One of the earliest audio logs in this level is all about how Ryan wanted to take advantage of Julie Langford's research into growing trees underwater, and sell attendance to the pleasure spaces of Arcadia, rather than making them free for all to visit. And a second audio log we find reveals the darker, more insecure, and even childish side of Andrew Ryan that led to this kind of monetization. Back on the surface, Ryan bought a forest at one point, and after the government demanded that he make public spaces within it, and the church said that it was God's forest and not his, he burned the entire place to the ground, not wanting it to be infected by the parasites of government or religion. 
Well, Ryan sees us as a parasite as well, marauding and stealing what we can never build for ourselves because Fontaine, our puppet master, is trying to use us to steal Rapture from Andrew Ryan. So with the parasite once again wandering in Ryan's forest, he burns the place to the ground, only this time using chemicals. There are much greater implications here than Ryan simply destroying the most beautiful part of the city. It's not just his forest he's destroying here. This is Ryan acknowledging that he might lose this fight and destroying all of Rapture to keep the parasite from plundering it. If Arcadia is destroyed, then Rapture will be devoid of oxygen within hours with how many fires are burning inside. Ryan would rather nobody have Rapture, or by extension anything, unless they built it for themselves. Ryan can be a cold, jaded man, and as twisted as his morals are, he firmly believes in them, and he will give up a lifetime of work to uphold them. While he can absolutely act hypocritically when everything is going fine, if push comes to shove, he'll die for what he believes in, that every man should choose for himself and make their own wins, and there's definitely something admirable about that. Jumping ahead to his death, he was willing to let himself be killed purely as punishment for something he did that we're about to discuss. When we're searching for ingredients to make the Lazarus Vector, a chemical that will reinvigorate the trees of Arcadia, we head to the farmer's market, and inside we find out what Tenenbaum and Ryan were cooking up to combat Fontaine's army of brainwashed poor. He would start using his superior plasmids to brainwash the better off, secretly injecting messages into them using his propaganda intercoms, taking away all the free will from those who hadn't already lost it to Fontaine. Would we not be able to effectively control the actions of the citizens of Rapture? Free will is the cornerstone of this city. The thought of sacrificing it is abhorrent. However, we are indeed in a time of war. While this is only one of a dozen things that led to the fall of Rapture, this is what caused the fall of Andrew Ryan, and of course it was an act of hypocrisy. Rapture was founded on the idea that every man should have the right to choose what is done with the sweat of his brow, and while Andrew Ryan agrees to Tenenbaum's brainwashing plan because as he puts it, desperate times call for desperate measures, I'm fairly certain that this is why he ultimately lets himself be killed by you. He sees it as poetic justice. The only thing he valued above all else was freedom, and he enslaved people, so you, a slave in every sense of the word, are the only one that can give him some closure by killing him. He wanted to be killed by the product of his own failures as a philosopher, which, if you agree, elevates one of the greatest scenes in all of gaming even further, but I'm beginning to get ahead of myself. Let's move on to the next area after Arcadia, Fort Frolic. Fort Frolic is especially interesting to me. As someone who values humans' ability to combine creativity with emotions above all others, it's interesting to see a negative example of artistry run rampant. I've often thought that the job of an artistic creator was to control the sort of thoughts a viewer is having. You can't control them directly, but you can influence them. By extension, I've always thought that if I could construct a house however I saw fit, I would frame all of its rooms in a way that drew attention to certain subjects to influence the tone of the room upon entry. Essentially, the same sort of artistic work that goes into level designing in games. Sander Cohen apparently has a similar mindset. While he can't rebuild his section of Rapture, he can decorate it in a ton of interesting ways, and his section of the game is the most linear, tightly directed section of the game. And when I say tightly directed, I don't mean by Bioshock's director, Ken Levine. I mean directed by Sander Cohen. Like any director, Sander Cohen controls our emotions by controlling what we see when, and as a result, this chapter is much more linear than the rest. Sandra Cohen's madness is beyond me, so rather than attempt to analyze the message behind his experience, let's keep in theme with the rest of this essay, and examine what Cohen's madness has to say, rather than what Cohen has to say. Fort Frolic doesn't seem so much to be about artistry gone rampant, more about an artist gone rampant due to lack of an audience. He rots in that Neverland, waiting for someone to come and tell him he still got it. However, there's a lot more to this chapter than a simple message that artists will go to major extremes if they aren't being noticed. I think it's also an examination of freedom, as much of Bioshock is. The freedom humans have, when compared to other animals, is what allows us to create art. And so when Cohen cuts off the transmission from Atlas, he's giving us freedom from Atlas's mind control. Freedom to create art. It's no coincidence that Cohen replaced Atlas's transmission with classical music. Cohen seems to see us as an actor in his play. As soon as he cuts our transmission, we get his introduction in the Bathysphere Bay, in which he announces with a ton of fanfare that we're in for an evening with Sandra Cohen. And our first scene takes place immediately outside, where we find that the once empty room has been filled with traps in a matter of seconds, not unlike a set change in a play. And we're forced to kill a set number of spider splicers before Cohen will unlock the door and let us move on to the next scene. 
And as we step into the atrium, the spotlight is literally on us, like a lead actor, and it follows us wherever we go inside of this atrium. Here, we're told to meet Cohen in Flea Hall, where we find he has a pianist held captain playing a piece for him, before executing the man for making one too many mistakes for his magnum opus, and we're told to take a picture of the man's dead body. And upon doing so, Cohen tells us that our collaboration begins with this act, and that he wants us to put the picture in a frame on his magnum opus. As he puts it, the burden of the artist is to capture, and in his opus, it seems to me that he wants to capture us in our act of artistic creation. He says that our canvas is to be painted with Andrew Ryan's blood, so he wants to capture how we go about murdering people. He has three pupils who he wants to capture us murdering, and he says that the common thread between them is that they're all betrayers, starting with Martin Finnegan, who we find in the pathway to Poseidon Plaza. I won't bother with going into detail on the three other subjects of Cohen's quad tick, as what's more interesting is what happens once we complete it. In Cohen's own words, the purpose of the photos on the quad tick was to immortalize his subject's mortality. A true disciple of Cohen would have shared this obsession with mortality and would have killed him. The fact that they didn't, in spite of Cohen attempting to coax them into it, Son of a bitch, left me to freeze. is, as I see it, the betrayal that Cohen mentions of them. So, in the end, when Cohen teases us with his grand prize that's only for his greatest pupil, If you had become my one and true disciple, you might have been worthy of seeing inside the box of my most private news. The only way to get it is to kill him and to take the key from his body, and if you share his obsession with death, you might photograph his body as he probably intended. The true final piece to his magnum opus, a photograph of his body, killed by his greatest disciple on a quest to destroy the man who made Cohen's vision possible, Andrew Ryan. That's the real reason that Cohen didn't kill you. He wanted to see if he was good enough to make you murder him and photograph his corpse. If that isn't dedication to using art to influence people's thoughts, then I don't know what is. Anyways, regardless of our choice, we actually make a choice here. Other than the Little Sisters, we have no choices throughout the game. And through Sandra Cohen's art, we finally get to make one. And isn't it fitting that as soon as we're done with Cohen, Atlas is able to reach us again? And he immediately says, would you kindly leg it to the sphere and get down to Hephaestus? So on we go to Hephaestus to confront Andrew Ryan and our darkest secret. Hephaestus. While many of the chapters covered so far were the sort that focused on one or more of the three cornerstones of Rapture, Hephaestus is another historical level, and Andrew Ryan's philosophy in particular is its subject. As we enter Hephaestus, the first thing we see is one of Rapture's familiar banners, saying the strong shall not be limited by the weak. Maybe I'm just seduced by Ryan's silver tongue this late in the game, but I really start to sympathize with Ryan by this point. Sure, we'll soon learn that Fontaine is the real villain, and that all he wanted was to own Rapture for himself, but it's never explicitly stated that Ryan is innocent. That's part of why Bioshock always hits me so hard. It respects your intelligence, and poses questions that are genuinely difficult to answer. Was Ryan's vision for mankind's salvation doomed from the start due to his hypocrisy? Was his philosophy about social trends only good on paper but not in practice? Is someone like Fontaine inevitable? Someone who's drawn to the potential power of a clever mind in rapture, and grows to want more and more power? Was Fontaine really just power mad, or was he disgusted by the hypocrisy on display all over rapture? While we don't know enough about the story to be asking these questions at this point in the game, during the last chapters we'll be thinking of many of the things we learn about Ryan here at Hephaestus as we ask them to ourselves. The biggest question relates back to our questions about the practicality of Ryan's philosophy. If you firmly believe in a philosophy, how much proof should you accept before resigning that it's failing? Rapture is coming back to life. Even now, can't you hear the breath returning to her lungs? The shops reopening, the schools humming with the thoughts of young minds. All the things I say that Rapture was founded on can all be summed up in one word. Philosophy. This place was built because one man thought his philosophy was the be-all end-all correct philosophy, and as I see it, Ryan took too long before accepting that his and Rapture's philosophy needed to adjust for the Fontaine situation. Ryan says in an audio log that he thought it would be impatient to put an end to splicing as soon as it became a problem. The way he sees it, the Great Chain is mightier than any one man's understanding, himself included and he thinks that cutting off one of the many hands pulling it in their direction would only weaken it in the long run. However, once Fontaine's boys were practically on Ryan's doorstep, he gave in, and he faltered in his philosophy by taking away the freedoms of those splicing Ryan industry plasmids, and using them to fight Fontaine's armies. There's two ways of looking at the problem here. The first is that if Ryan had stepped in earlier and put an end to the plasmid industry, Rapture would have survived the blow to its philosophy. And the second is that Ryan should have never given in and stooped to Fontaine's level. 
Either way, things probably would have ended better for the common people of Rapture. And while I already have an explanation that I'm happy with, this would give Ryan even more reason to finally let you, a puppet of Fontaine, kill him. Which brings us to the finale of Hephaestus, Rapture Central Computing. And this is the area in which this game goes from being incredibly thought-provoking to a work of genius for me. We're all familiar with the plot twist that's revealed here, so I'll only play it up with some of its deserved fanfare. After a brief, one-sided conversation with Andrew Ryan, he says that there's a time to build and a time to destroy. Knowing that he's about to let himself be killed by Fontaine, he begins to destroy Rapture, preferring that fate over it being twisted by another man's philosophy. And in his final hours, Ryan arranged himself an incredibly meaningful death. Would you kindly? A phrase that everyone in this game likely thought of as an easily recognizable speech pattern from Atlas. However, there's a much more sinister meaning behind his use of the phrase. We're much more closely related to Rapture than we've been told. By now, we've probably gotten used enough to the chains on our characters' wrists that we stopped thinking about the ultimate question they posed. How are we chained to Rapture? Well, an elaborate display, supposedly set up by Ryan, shows us how. Dr. Suchong stole our character from his mother at birth, and under Atlas's orders, made us a sleeper agent for his cause, to kill Andrew Ryan, and get the keys to Rapture for himself, and the code phrase that controls us is, would you kindly? Is you that your puppy? She's a very pretty. Thank you, Papa Suchong. Break her neck for me. What? Break that sweet puppy's neck. No, please. Break that puppy's neck. Would you kindly? No. No. Very good. Herein lies the meta element to Bioshock's plot twist that takes it a notch above what it would have been without it, but I'll get into that after I cover what happens next. Andrew Ryan's death, and what may very well be the most interesting and impactful cutscene to date for its length. I don't want to retread old ground, but I'd like to talk about why Ryan sets up his murder by you the way that he does. He wasn't trying to defeat you through his death, by showing you that you have no free will. He was trying to atone for what he sees as his greatest sin, compromising in his philosophy that he values so much. Rapture was founded on total freedom, and when he decided to brainwash the users of Ryan's plasmids, he takes away their freedom, and it seems like as far as he's concerned, this is what ultimately led to the fall of Rapture. So to be killed by you, a product of those experiments, would be the ultimate poetic justice in his eyes. He doesn't see himself as dying by Fontaine's hand, he sees it as dying by his own mistakes. So with that out of the way, we have a chance to talk about the game's meta narrative. While it isn't nearly as complicated as Prey's meta narrative, it's interesting nonetheless, and the presence of one even as simple as this can add a lot to a game. So Bioshock is a linear game, right? If you take a look at its most raw, barebones story elements, it's a game in which you're a character in a strange place and a more familiar character bosses you around throughout the game with phrases like, would you kindly? It's a fairly cliched story element, no different in Spartan function to show Dan, Colonel Campbell, GLaDOS, or Admiral Havelock, all characters who boss you around for most of the game before revealing their true identity or showing their sinister side before you continue following their orders regardless. It happens in a lot of games, and it puts into question the concept of free will in a linear game. Bioshock, System Shock, Metal Gear Solid, all of these games are strictly linear, while still giving the player tons of freedom in how they tackle different problems. But there is no changing the plot, or if there is, it's very basic, like Bioshock's Little Sisters, or giving into Ocelot's Torture, mostly just affecting which mostly similar ending you get. By and large, your destiny has already been decided for you in these games. And every time an Atlas or a Shodan tells you to do something, it just solidifies that fact. Characters like Solid Snake or the Hacker from System Shock might as well be brainwashed like our protagonist is in Bioshock. No matter what the player wants for them, they're destined to follow Shodan's orders until they eventually get to break free and rebel. I think it's fair to say that the brainwashing subplot of Bioshock is a direct reference to that idea. After all, Atlas still lies about his identity and fakes his family's death. That would have worked just as well if they figured out some other way to explain the plane crash. But the fact that they included this tells me that they're commentating on the cliches of this type of linear game. This is driven home, pun intended, by Andrew Ryan's death. As he orders us to kill him, we realize that it could have just as easily been him ordering us around on the radio, and we wouldn't have questioned it any more or less than we did with Atlas. Like I said, nothing as complicated as Prey's meta-narrative, but an essential part of the game nonetheless. So moving on, we take the keys to Rapture off of Ryan's body, and when we insert them into the central computer, Atlas reveals himself to be Fontaine, and he takes control of Rapture for himself, stopping Andrew Ryan's self-destruct protocol. So when Fontaine sends his security bots after us as a reward for a job well done, we run away and a restored little sister signals for us to crawl into an air duct, and depending on how we treated the little sisters, it's either a trap or a helping hand. Either way, it gets us away from Fontaine's bots and puts us at the mercy of Tenenbaum, 
the mother figure to the little sisters. Apollo Square For the purpose of brevity, I'll cover what happens next as I saw it in my most recent playthrough. I had chosen to harvest the little sisters in this playthrough, and so Tenenbaum asked me to redeem myself by saving any I saw in future, before removing the first level of Fontaine's brainwashing, and the objective of the next chapter, Olympus Heights, is to find the serum to remove the final level of it, as Fontaine is still able to keep us from reaching him. Not so quick, kid. I still got enough police on that brain of yours to keep you from getting any closer than my roost. So, the main idea of this Rapture History-themed chapter is to learn about how Fontaine built up his army, and to break away from Fontaine's chains. Not to disappoint, but there really isn't that much more to this chapter than that, especially when compared to fantastic chapters like Fort Frolic, Arcadia, or Hephaestus. And like I said earlier, a lot of what we learn here I've already mentioned in earlier sections to give further context to certain points. I've already gone over how Fontaine used Rapture's downtrodden to force Andrew Ryan's hand, he started with his home for the poor, then had his goons smuggle in religious paraphernalia, giving the poor religion, and forcing Ryan to crack down on him, causing the normal people to sympathize with Fontaine further, and having more of them use his plasmids, before getting Dr. Suchong to help him flip the switch and turn all the Fontaine plasmid users into a slave army, along with the homeless in a shelter. I wish I had more cause to stay at Apollo Square, but again, I've already covered most of what's revealed here. I will say, before moving on, that this section solidifies a new tradition in 0451 games like Bioshock, a living quarters area in which we get a visual understanding of all the characters we've met through audio log. I'd wager that most attentive players could guess whose room is whose based solely on what's found inside. This moment can also be seen in System Shock 2, Prey, spread out through Tacoma, and a handful of other games that follow the System Shock lineage. It's a great way to reward players who get to know the audio log characters, but again, not much else to add to this chapter. The final chapter, however, is full of interesting things to note. Point Prometheus Being the final chapter, it makes sense that Point Prometheus would be one of the most important parts of the game. All of the philosophy that Rapture was founded on, unrestricted artistry, industry, and science, the right to the entirety of the fruits of your labor, the desire to grow beyond what civilization restricts humanity to, it all leads back to one key word, freedom. Whether your freedom was taken from you by Andrew Ryan indirectly or by Fontaine directly, the mind programming is gone. You can finally decide for yourself. There's just one issue with that. Bioshock is still a linear game. And sure enough, even after the most liberating moment in the game, freeing yourself from Fontaine's mind programming, you're still stuck taking orders from Tenenbaum. Shy! You let him get away! Oh, I need a moment for thinking. Functionally, she's done nothing other than replace Atlas. She's the one bossing us around now, and we may as well still be mind-programmed. This is especially apparent in the light of all the horrible things we have to do to herself by her orders in order to get to Fontaine. Fontaine even points this out as we transform into a big daddy. You think turning yourself into one of those tin men is a two-way street? The crowd's holding auditions for the Frankenstein parade, and you're first in line. <laughs> Here's another example of an 0451 tradition, one that we've been taking part in since the beginning. In a lot of 0451 games, or other genres that nonetheless take inspiration from the 0451 lineage, we see our character come closer and closer to being consumed by the cause of the game's problem. In System Shock 2, the hacker might choose to research exotics and be wearing armor made of the mini's larva and using the mini's weapons. In Prey, we might choose to invest more and more in exotic neuromods until security systems begin confusing us for an alien. In Half-Life, we have to use the B launcher, or whatever it's called, that we attach to Gordon's hand. In Deus Ex, we get more and more biomods until we're completely detached from a normal human, with drones coming out of our head constructed by microbots. Even in Thief, Garrett's mechanical eyeball can be seen as him being consumed by the Metal Age, which threatened to destroy that game's world. And in Bioshock, we get more and more spliced up until we're literally turning ourselves into a big daddy. Herein lies one potential plot hole, but one that's been explained away on forums in a way that I can get behind. Fontaine says that there's no going back after transforming into a big daddy, but in this ending cutscene slide, we see Jack's hands, perfectly normal again. Well, we haven't had the mind programming necessary to completely turn us into a big daddy, so I'll buy it. It's just funny to picture Jack walking the little sisters down the wedding aisle with the whale voice of a big daddy. But what's more interesting than a nitpick is, again, what our paradoxical willingness to become a big daddy says about player choice in the linear game. Not to repeat myself too much, but like in System Shock and Metal Gear Solid, we have all the power in the world to approach situations however we see fit, but we're still stuck in a story where the ending's already been written. Furthering this idea of the pointlessness of our decisions is the fact that regardless of how we handle the Little Sisters, they give us an atom syringe and drain the atom out of Fontaine regardless. 
but I'm getting ahead of myself. In the previous chapter, Fontaine mentioned that he's just now started splicing, and he quickly gets addicted to it, seeing as being the owner of two plasmid manufacturers, he has access to more atom than the entirety of Rapture combined. So, as we begin this chapter, we get our first glimpse of the newly spliced up monster that is Fontaine. The first thing he does is pull a Great Chain statue off the floor and throw it at us. Fontaine pulled on the Great Chain just as Andrew Ryan wanted, but he pulled harder than anyone could have predicted, and now the Great Chain serves as nothing but another advantage for him to draw from. Fontaine lived his life by the Great Chain, and as his last words suggest, he broke it and is disappointed with the results of what he saw as fair play. I had you built! I sent you topside! I called you back, showed you what you was, what you was capable of! Even that life you thought you had, that was something I dreamed up, and I tattooed inside your head! Now if you don't call that family, I don't know what it is! In essence, Fontaine is Ryan's greatest disciple, surpassing him in greed and pushing his philosophy to its breaking point. So as he dies, he has nothing to do but lament the death of his and Ryan's philosophy. He has nothing to say for himself, choosing instead to complain about how something he dreamed up and bankrolled ended up being his downfall. The difference between Ryan and Fontaine is that Ryan saw the impending doom of his philosophy and chose to die with it, hoping to wash himself of his failures, whereas Fontaine took it to his grave, kicking and screaming. He was the ultimate parasite, stealing Ryan's city and, more importantly, his philosophy, and being so afraid of creating his own that he would rather die clinging to someone else's dream. Bioshock is one of the densest games of all time. I probably could have done an entire commentated walkthrough and not run out of things to talk about. While I think Ryan is the more interesting of the two antagonists, it's interesting to see how Ryan's dream was indeed destroyed by the ultimate parasite. Rather than take a percentage of Ryan's business ventures, Fontaine tried to take everything that was Ryan, and sure enough, Rapture died because of it. However, I think Fontaine's manipulation of the legal systems of Rapture doesn't speak to Fontaine's failings, but to Ryan's. Again, Rapture was founded on hypocrisy, or perhaps misunderstanding would be the better word. While Ryan wanted to escape the parasites of government and church that infested the surface, he didn't realize that parasitism is part of human nature. He didn't remove the parasite, he simply replaced it. Everybody in Rapture was a parasite. The poor, the rich, the business owners, and the artists. They all survived by sucking the blood out of each other. And following the tradition set by the formation of modern society, the biggest, most powerful parasites rose to the top. And next thing you know, the world of Rapture resembled everything that Ryan wanted to escape. Philosophically, how is a large company like Ryan Industries selling addictive plasmids to citizens any different than a governmental body taxing citizens? Sure, Ryan built it up on his own and gave that opportunity to everybody in Rapture, but that opportunity was nothing other than to grow into a greater parasite. Man wasn't limited in Rapture like it was on the surface, and in the end, that only served to bring out the parasite in all of us.